All right. How are you? Good. How are you doing? I am great. I'm fantastic. Awesome. And I hope you are all great, fantastic, and awesome as well. Yes. Welcome to The Harvest, episode number 23, where we discuss all things cinema and story. And as we learn, you learn as we grow, you grow. My name is Xavier Garcia. And I'm Jonathan Garcia. Now, here we are, part two of a two-parter. We've been doing this like one part of two, uh, two part of three part of things quite a bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've got some good feedback. People really like that, like to continue certain stories because yeah. there's uh, a lot to say out there right. about certain topics, and I think that we should continue them. Well, we've got a lot to say about this topic. Here we are in part two. Last week, in part one, we discussed the symbiotic relationship that is art and culture. How culture can define art, but how art can actually help shape culture. This week, we're uh, talking a little bit more specifically about how within that relationship, art and culture together impact the individuals. Whether it is a specific group in society or just one person, art can impact us emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. This is something that I believe everyone can understand no matter the content, no matter the medium, no matter you know um, the approach to it. Everyone at some point in their lives has been impacted by art because art is the representation of what makes us human wherein lies its power. This is why it has been born from major movements in history, um, which have helped define or create you know, those, um, those, those actual moments. Art has to help define and create those mm -hmm. moments. And has been able to convince people through education and entertainment of any one particular idea or series of ideas. That is the power of art. Yes. You ready to do yes. this? Yeah, we'll let's get right do it. into it. Yeah. All right, let's do it. Now, here we go. Why does art matter? You know, art matters to you. F um, well, you tell me, and then I'll, I'll go through the notes as far as, you know, why does art matter? Well, art, um, art besides the fact that it brings uh, new information or, or, or unique perspectives it has the power to persuade yeah has the power to teach educate people on whatever it is the subject matter is mm -hmm. um i think um art is i feel necessary um let's put it this way um in the beginning uh god created and if it wasn't by his art and his creation in the heavens, we wouldn't know of his splendor. Yeah. We wouldn't have an understanding of the fact that, wait a minute, maybe there is a God. You know, when you look at the heavens, the heavens declare his glory. That's his creation. And so we're able to be educated and know and understand that in a way we're kind of without excuse and understanding, wow, all of this can't just be created with um, some sort of, you know, chaotic, chaotic. Exactly. It's too beautiful. Un Everything has uh, unmeasured, has, and un yeah, has knowledge, intelligible. Yeah. Everything creation. is intelligible. All creation, if you look at it, is intelligible. Well, art. Um, I mean, not only does it preserve and educate, but it bridges gaps and it also brings people together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and it does so through the expression of the human condition. You know, our art is a universal language. Sure. It's very universal. Mm -hmm. um, you listen to, for example, a piece of music, or you look at a beautiful work of art. Like you, you're standing in front of the Mona Lisa, you know. And I've uh, I've had that that opportunity, um, and you look at this painting, and you're like, wow. And I think a mixture of that, I mean, you know, I, I, last episode I talked about my experiences at looking at the Statue of David. Now, there are, there are personal reasons. It's not just because it's beautiful art. There are also personal reasons, you know, to my, the, my moment of, like, impact when I mm -hmm. looked at that statue when I was in Florence, you know, and I went in back in uh, 2003, and um, I went into the museum to see this, the, the Statue of, of David. You know, it had a, a grip within me, not because it's beautiful sculpture because it is it's beautiful sculpture but because it also resonated personally for me um as a man of faith understanding you know what whom was being depicted you know all of that and everything all of the stories of my entire life came together 
you know, the story of my faith conversion, the story of my artistic journey, the story of my storytelling journey, all of those stories and all those journeys came together at that one pinnacle moment as I'm standing before this statue and I wept Mm -hmm. and I cried. And I looked around and there were other people with their jaws dropped, phones out, you know, like cameras out, some weeping, some crying, some laughing, but all having a response, all having a communication with this art. And it was being deposited into them and then they were in turn turning to one another and talking about it, dialoguing about it, expressing their hearts, their thoughts, their desires, their ideas about it. And that's why I feel like we can confidently say that art is a very universal language because the people that were there watching it were from all parts of the world. Mm -hmm. You know, there were all tourists from everywhere, all just at the same time, awed and inspired. Yeah. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I, I'm blanking out on what movie it is, but I know that um, uh, there's a scene in a particular movie, and it'll probably come to me before the end of this podcast, but, um, you know, some guy is uh, comes to uh, African land and um, he's oh. trying to communicate. Uh, is it the gods must be crazy? I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. The gods <laughs> must be crazy. He's, you know, like they're trying to communicate, but yeah. you know, he ends up doing this performance, and they're all just start laughing. You know, and they're in the, and, and that expression of that performance, they were able to communicate and become friendly. You know what I mean? Things like so. It's like it, it is. It's so universal. You don't have to learn a language, but a certain expression or a certain form of creation, a form or. Oh it, no! It, I know what you're talking. <laughs> you're talking about Ben Stiller when he gets captured. I think it, um, and with Martin, um, he gets captured. He goes crazy. He, they're all actors, and they get dropped off in an island. Uh, oh, that's... And, and he gets captured, and then he gets turned into the performer for the village of people. <laughs> you know, is it that? No, uh, no, no, but I know Tropic what Thunder. Tropic Thunder. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. It's a controversial uh, movie. Yeah, yeah. But, 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 but you get what I'm saying? Like, but, the, yeah, he's able to unify... Him, you know himself with the people and, and find peace with them right. as a result of the art uh, his expression as a as an actor <laughs> as an actor yeah yeah uh. so it's I, I mean yeah to to your point is yeah it's so universal that you don't have to learn a language to right. be able to communicate with someone you just use art or the yeah. the the technique of art to yeah. be able to communicate with an individual yeah no ev- look every culture every historical period every language uses art and creativity um, to as a form of expression mm-hmm. and to creatively express, um, and a lot of times there are common, very universal themes that connect various uh, places and people, um, and it does what art does best, and it, that is to allow us to experience the human condition. Mm-hmm. That's what art does best. Mm-hmm. That's it's, you know, <clears throat> it connects us to what it means to be human. Yeah, it connects us to like those very, very, very human, fundamental human elements like love, fear, mm-hmm. you know, uh, joy, you know, those, those very human things that are not mm-hmm. like quantifiable, like you can't, you can't measure them, you can't, you know, put a, a measuring tape and, and measure love, mm-hmm. you know, you can't, um, you know, pour fear into a beaker, and, you know, like those are very human things that are particular and specific to human and art expresses those. Mm-hmm. How can art express something that is incalculable you know what i mean and that's the power of art is it not yeah absolutely it like you said um it makes an individual think wow they experience that too um they feel that too they see that too i'm not alone yeah it unifies and that's the power of art is it's able to sometimes bring out um the reality of things that don't want to be expressed or are, are hard to express. Yeah. No, look, like, here's a... you smiling. A, oh, I'm so, 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 so thinking still about the scene in Tropic Thunder <laughs> where they, where they kidnap him. Yeah. And he becomes their puppet. Yeah. And he's just doing his movies. He's reenacting his whole movies. And he com- he's convinced in his own mind that they love him. And he goes crazy. He goes, and he goes to get rescued. And he goes, they love me here. I'm not leaving. <laughs> anyway, that movie's ridiculous. Uh, all right. No, so composers like Beethoven or artists like uh, Gustav Klimt, they're both Austrian. Mm. Even though Beethoven was born in Germany, they're, they're both of Austrian descent. Um, we don't need to have ever visited Austria, 
nor do we need to be able to speak, you know, their native languages, you know, uh, either one of them, um, nor do we have to know them even personally, you know, I'm talking, you know, Klimt or, 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 or Beethoven, in order for us to be like, to experience and be moved by the beauty of Moonlight Sonata. You know, Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata yeah, yeah, or, yeah. Or, or Klimt's The, Ki the Kiss. You mm -hmm. know, we don't need to know the technical things. We don't have to have those measurements. Who are you as a person? You know, who, and we've, we've gotten into debates about this. We've talked about this, you know, where we don't necessarily agree with a person's character or their politics. We don't agree with what they stand for. We don't agree with and, and, the measurables. But when we see the art that is produced, Mm -hmm. We like we're able to separate the two and say, oh wow, you know that's beautiful art. Like I don't know Beethoven, I don't know him, I don't know much about his life. Yeah, there are biographies written, but we don't know what he was doing in his you know his secret lives. You know, like what kind of a person he was. He could have been a really crummy human being. Mm -hmm. He could have been evil. He could have been terrible. I don't know. Or maybe he was the most benevolent and amazing person. That doesn't matter. When you listen to Moonlight Sonata, you're moved. Yeah. You yeah. don't need the measurables in order to understand the, the language of art, right? right? Yeah, and I think there's also this scientific um, study about certain arts that um, biologically move your system, like your, your, your whole nervous system and your whole mental, oh, yeah. uh, um, you know, synapses processing. And, and exactly. the synapses and how they fire. I mean, you're able to learn through classical right. uh, music. I know, I know that, like, for example, they had suggested when my son was in, you know, my wife's womb, like, to play classical right. music because it, it helps fire those synapses and develop, you know, in development and, right. and all and that Right, so stuff. certain sound tones and... You know, they they help with, you know, even sicknesses yeah. and, and yep. different yep. things like yep. that, which that is pretty too. amazing. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, uh, different vibrations and mm -hmm. sound and, you know, it, yeah, yeah, it, it is. It's wild, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and you can imagine a lot of times some person who is, um, you know, watching an art is able to come out of, you know, certain um, sicknesses as depression. well because of depression. Anxieties. You know? Oh, yeah. Exactly. And so, you know, people who are losing their hair because of stress, you know, sometimes art is that healing, you know. Yeah. So you can imagine how much art is, art is not just, you know, this tool of expression and teaching, but it also could be a tool of healing. Yeah. And if we're capable and able of finding art even in nature, we can find healing in, in, in the expression, you know, like the expression of art through nature, through, mm -hmm. you know, I know here there's there's a I'm not going to give you names, but there's a, you know, someone in my family. Um, whom was going through deep depression um, and was in severe pain mm -hmm. as a result of a surgery. Mm -hmm. And they were having anxiety and they were, uh, a series of circumstances, you know, had occurred that this person was left alone um, to deal with this pain alone. Mm -hmm. and, um, and they were rehabbing after having had multiple surgeries and they stepped out onto their porch, into their backyard, and, you know, in pain, miserable at the world, hating everyone, hating themselves, hating God. I mean, like, you know, everything sure, impossible. Yeah, yeah. And then all of a sudden, and this is a true story because this person is told, you know, per personally r related and confided this in me. They saw the, the sun coming up above um, the line of trees in his backyard, beautiful home, beautiful backyard. Never seen it before this way. Finally, was, eyes were open to see the beauty and the art of God's creation, it was overlooking the water. And he said that at that moment, he felt, he felt the love of God, of his creator calling him. Mm. And he said that as a result of seeing that, he was healed. He was wow. healed, not just spiritually, but even the, his physical healing was mm. accelerated. Wow. I mean, come on. Now, yeah. doctors, I'm sure, will explain that away with a million and one different sure. you yeah. know, types of like, things that are happening in the human body, I'm sure. But look, the bottom line is that to him, it was the art that he saw displayed before him that brought him awareness of, you know, um, well, first and foremost, his, you know, his creator. And secondly, um, the appreciation mm -hmm. of life. Right. And he had appreciation of life. So I'm sure that some of you all out there have, you know, personal experiences of like you've been going through depression. Yeah. And you listen to a inside, song. A hard and there's time. a song. Yeah, yeah. And there's like that song that like, oh, man, this song. I see it all the time. You see it in Facebook. Like this song saved my life. You know, like that kind of stuff. Like you mm -hmm. see it all the time. And that's the same. It's the same thing. 
Mm -hmm. It's amazing that power mm -hmm. that art has. Now, there's um, depending on you know your depth of of knowledge and understanding of of Beethoven, for example, we're using him or, or Klimt as as our examples. Like once you get to know and you get to study them and you look into the measurables, you know, well, who were they as a person? What was the culture at their time? You know, what were the influences that you know the social economical, political influences upon them. Now you get to understand how the culture was affecting the music, the art that came out of them. And, that, and that's the symbiotic relationship that we were talking about in the last episode, where culture can affect art, but the art and the artist can also affect culture. And we've mm -hmm. seen that, and we, and we, you know, it's it's easy now to then discern why Moonlight Moonlight Sonata was what it was. If you then to start to to you know do a little bit of research, and there are there are experts that talk about this all the time because you know that's what we do. The moment that something has been written, or mm -hmm. something has been composed, or something has been drawn, we we you know create PhDs in order to define what it is that's been written or drawn mm -hmm. or, or or spoken, you know, or whatever it is, and so. This has been debated since it was written and since it was composed. Um, and people can then talk about it and tell you, oh, you know, the reason why these notes are this way is because of this was going on in his life. And, you know, people do it with Picasso, certain eras in his life. You know, oh, he was going through depression during mm -hmm. this time. And so he was painting this and he was being afflicted by this debt. So he was doing that. You know, it happens. And so we see that working itself into art. But we also see the artist working his influence into culture mm -hmm. all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Can I Absolutely. ask you a question? Can you give me an example? Do you have an example of like a good modern day, uh, a modern day example of a film or a theme or a story that transcends cultural differences? Like it, it goes above and beyond differences in culture and it really actually connects to like the human condition and who we are as humans. No matter what the culture surrounding the film or the, or whether it's a foreign film or a domestic yeah. film. Gosh. Um... I mean, I, I have a, a unique experience. Maybe this might prime one of yeah, yours. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I was, so I was living in Spain back in 2003. That's when I went to, um, you know, to the Louvre and I went to, to, um, to Florence and mm -hmm. got to travel a little bit and see these, this art. Um, <clears throat> but when I was living in Spain, I was, uh, I was, I was taking a, a, a film course studying Almodovar, the famous Spanish filmmaker yeah. and some of his films. Yeah. But in one of the film courses interestingly enough i watched a german film and it's a very famous german film everyone will know immediately as soon as i give the name run lola run uh -huh, yeah, yeah, yeah 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 um and you know it, oh, it yeah. was a 1998 german um yeah. experimental thriller film and um i tom tom tyke were if i pronounce his last name correctly the 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 director Tyker, um yeah. and so anyway and just to give you a brief, you know, a, a, a brief uh, recap of the film, it's kind of like a Groundhog Day type of film. You know, it's this woman whom, you know, she, her, her boyfriend uh, misplaces a money bag and a homeless man picks it up. You know, he gets scared. And so he has, he owns, owes gangsters, you know, like a hundred thousand dollars or whatever, a hundred thousand German dollars. And, um... And as a result, he calls her, like, you know, saying, you know, they're going to kill me, I'm, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so she uh, runs out of her apartment and she runs past the dog and, and, you know, jumps over the dog and the person and then, like, goes to, the, to her father, her father who works at a bank to try and get money. And anyway, you see that scenario played out three different times three different ways because it's like the butterfly effect you know she changes a decision because at the end in the first one she ends up getting killed mm -hmm. uh in the second scenario she doesn't make it in time in the third scenario it's like really serendipitous and so each scenario is different because she changes something that she does and every time she does something new and it you know the themes there are talking about like free will versus uh predestination it talks about um you know uh faith uh versus you know te uh you, you know like this is your your uh um, your act def definite fate. outcome, yeah. uh, fate. Yes, mm -hmm. thank you. And um, you know, and, and and what was interesting is that I watched a German film in Spanish in Spain as an American student, right? So it's like three cultures right there, mm -hmm. three cultures colliding, and and me watching these three cultures. But what was interesting was the impact that it had on me. 
Mm -hmm. It had a faith impact on me Mm. to watch that film. You know, and for those of you that know a little bit about my past, like, you know, kind of like the kind of the the major awakening and faith transitional moment that I experienced while I was living abroad and, you know, back in 2003, back in Spain and and whatnot. And so, but, but I could see, you know, just kind of this, a seed that had been deposited in me for storytelling, for filmmaking. I mean, after I saw that film, I'm like, yeah, absolutely. I gotta, I, this is what I need to do. It was because of that film that I decided to do my, like this huge project that I did my senior year. I did a uh, documentary my senior year as like a major project for my, um, one of my majors. Mm. And, um, and I, I, you know, I chose that and, and it was because of that. But here was this foreign film dealing with foreign issues, right? Or things that were going on in Germany at the time, you know, um, cla- neoclassical thinking and whatnot. Um, and, in a another foreign country being seen through the eyes of a foreigner to the third degree and it just what it did with me you know and how it moved me and transformed and changed certain things in me like that was that was a major impactful moment yeah you know as you say that um and i thought i think we've talked about this and it's not a movie it's a show but why i think it's so brilliant it's because of that very same fact because it does transcend culture um right now Um, And surprisingly, and I'll tell you the show in a minute, uh, it has recently spiked in views um, because of some sort of, I don't even know what it is, whether it's a, uh, we've been deprived of the freedom to express ourselves um, as humans. And it's a comedy. And it's The Office. Oh. Um, because we're in a culture right now where everything is very, you know, um, politically correct. <laughs> and that um, is the most politically incorrect show. And, and it, yeah. But it's so, it, but it's human because yes. we as humans are, wow. are so um, faulty and we make mistakes yes. and we're sometimes ignorant. But at the same time, that's what makes us humans because we can make mistakes and we can understand that it's it everyone deals with that problem right now i'm you looking know? at you but i'm like <laughs> yeah well that's, like, that's how i am too because i found myself watching my, like my wife she doesn't watch those shows she no. just, just, just doesn't and she found herself watching and i dude i th- i honestly i think it's the the oppressive nature of cancel culture yeah that yeah. has gotten everyone even those that are the cancelers going to watch The Office. And it's, you know, and, and, it's, and no one's talking <laughs> oh, about it, Scott. but, <laughs> you know, Netflix is show. they see the numbers. Yeah. They see that thing be, uh, spiking oh. up and seeing that everyone's watching this. It's, it's been gonna... memified. Everybody talks about how they're all watching exactly. The Office during and COVID it, quarantine. And it's brilliant. And, you know, I think Ricky Gervais understands that sometimes we have to make fun of this perfectionness. Yeah. And we have to have the freedom to make mistakes yeah. because that is who we are as humans. Yeah. We are not perfect. Deal with it type of scenario. Yeah. And let's laugh at it. Yeah. And I think that, that that's, that's very freeing as human beings. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I know plenty of times. I remember being in college. Uh, and I remember people yelling out racial slurs behind me. And, and it's not so much that, you know, I'll, I'll deal with it. And I'll, but there's a certain type of um, mental, uh, mental uh, strength that we as humans need to have. This sort of, you know, uh, you know like knowing that they're imperfect a perfect person is is trying to insult me you know what i mean another and imperfect person. another imperfect person who somehow is gonna probably at some point insult someone else exactly somehow, one who, way or at some point i'm going to insult someone else not that i'm valuing or giving them any permission sort of permission or, to do so right but i think it's pretty simple to me in this fact alone and again it goes back to my faith that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of god and that for me is key when i think like that i have love and i'm able to show them a better way i'm able to instead of answering back with with fire um you know i answer back with know me know me instead of you 
thinking you know me. Right. You know what I mean? And I, I'm going off on a tangent there, but I guess it's it's really that aspect of like you know. Well, uh, no, I mean the, you bring the, up the, something the, good. The gift, the gift of being able to use art to go beyond what sometimes the culture is being oppressed by. Um, and it's necessary. That's yeah. why all art is necessary. Yeah. You know, I feel like the freedom of expression of art is so necessary, even if I don't agree with it, because it allows me to begin a dialogue. It allows me to be able to um, know what is not good and know what is right. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, and and look, it does it does bring up a, a really some interesting. Uh, Arguments. I mean, like, where does where do you draw the line? You know, like yeah. between art and and you know and a psychopath. You know, like yeah. some. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. I think That's at true. the end, if it's not um, if it's not instigating violence or violence against others or violence against self. Um, I, I mean, I don't know. That's, a, that's another way. topic. Yeah. Let's put it this itself, way. You know? I so, think the key to the beginning of these particular solutions is communication. If a dialogue continues, if people can talk and converse, a lot of times you'll find yourself that they relate because we are humans. We bleed the same blood red. Man, you have perfectly transitioned it to the next section. All right, let's do you it. You have. Um, although I would love to just kind of linger and talk a little bit about The Office and <laughs> Michael yeah, Scott's yeah. humanity. Yeah, which is <laughs> brilliant. Uh, <laughs> it is brilliant. Um, you know, you bring up something really important, rhetoric. Mm, you yes. know, and just the concept of rhetoric, dialogue, um, but uh, not just dialogue as far as conversation back and forth, speech, uh, but yeah. rhetoric, speech, yeah. yeah, and the art of rhetoric, and mm -hmm. you know, this is, um, it, you know, let's let's go back to Aristotle. You know, now we we have studied a lot of Aristotle's works, like for example, poetics uh, as writers and as storytellers. You know, you got to read poetics because it is the foundation of. Cinema. It is the foundation of you know the three act structure and storytelling. But there's a, Aristotle also wrote um, rhetoric, or on rhetoric, whatever you know the book rhetoric. Aristotle's rhetoric back uh, fourth century BC, and he discusses in in rhetoric the the technical method of persuasion, mm -hmm. um, and this has been used by storytellers, by orators, by presidents, kings, politicians. You know, right. since since then. Yeah. Yeah, and and the and the three the three main points if you gotta like boil this down you know to the Spark Notes version or even even less less than the Spark Notes the Garcia Brothers version uh, or rather for the sake of this podcast the three things that we want to boil down are you know the ethos the logos yeah. and the pathos yeah um, the ethos being connected to the, the the creator the writer the speaker himself mm -hmm. you know the, that person's uh, Artists, the artist's credibility uh, on a subject or a concept, you know, the, whom they are and how, whether or not they are a credible source or a credible person mm -hmm. in order to be even qualified sure. to speak on behalf. Yeah. That, yeah. That, the, the logos, which is the, the written word, the logos, mm -hmm. the content mm -hmm. itself, mm -hmm. um, the facts, the logic. Uh, the, the reason, the why the artist is making a, a valid point is the logos and, and the pathos, which is kind of the audience, the receptor. The, the other end of that, the artist's emotional appeal to the audience and the audience's reception of that emotional appeal. Those three areas are kind of what Aristotle really highlights and talks about and goes deeper into explaining in, in, in rhetoric. <clears throat> These three things, they work together um, like checks and balances, similar to like the governmental you know, system, the, 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 three, the three pillars of, uh, mm, of government, mm -hmm, you know, yeah. like there's, there are check and balances between the, con you know, like, you know what I mean, yeah, like it they, they, they yeah. has to be, yeah. there has to be, um, in order for them to work together as one harmonious mm -hmm. unit. Um, and likewise, in rhetoric or as an orator, which is a, a, in and of itself a form and an, uh, an art form and a storytelling form, the three must work together in order to present a um, a cohesive story that is that that reaches the level of art. Now we're going to talk about why it reaches the level of art with some examples, right? Um, the best one that I can think of right now is Martin Luther King Jr. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, and I think the reason why even that one is prevalent in my brain is just because of the times that we're living in. Sure. You know, mm -hmm. um, the BLM and Tifa, uh, you know, 
craziness that we're living in right now brings to my mind and my thought, you know, just kind of like what was accomplished by Dr. Martin Luther King mm-hmm. Jr. Um, I want to talk real briefly and just kind of t- touch upon his ability um, of, uh, to, of rhetoric, you know, his ability to communicate and not just communicate and give a speech and then that's it, but in it to tell a story that was so moving, so impactful, so transcendent even of the black culture that it reaches us today no matter the color of your skin right. and touches you personally mm-hmm. today. That's the power of, of rhetoric. Mm-hmm. Um, and I want to talk a, a little bit about him um, and kind of like some of the techniques that he yeah. used. Yeah, let's do it. So we know what he was able to accomplish. Obviously, the civil rights movement in the United States was kind of his, uh, his, his time. That was his platform mm-hmm. and what he was able to achieve as a result of his rhetoric. Now, I, I also think that the fact that he was so tragically taken from us um, and essentially martyred, right? Uh, a man of faith who was standing up, not, not really... He was standing up, yes, for, the, for his race, Mm-hmm. But he was standing up for his race as a result of his convictions and relationship with his God. Right, right. And it was his relationship with God and his understanding, true understanding. Of the human condition. Yeah. And the Bible. Mm-hmm. That he knew and had an understanding of the human condition. Yeah. And how we ought to live as brothers mm-hmm. and sisters. Yeah. Right? Not, not the, the cursory breakdown of the Bible that most um, atheists like to, you know... Like to break down, oh, look, you know, God says that you're allowed to have slaves in the Old Testament and therefore, you know, slavery is is legal in Christianity. No, 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 no. God was trying to do away with slavery from the very beginning because here he brought these people out of a culture that had an oppressive slavery and said, oh, by the way, I know that I can't wipe away slavery from you altogether because you will deteriorate as a culture and as a people. But what I am going to do is impose upon you a set of rules as to how you ought to treat your slave. Number one, they're equal. Like Abraham and Eliezer, right? We know that story. We know that Eliezer didn't have any sons, and therefore all of his property, his billions, right? Because we don't know, we can't, we can't quantify how much riches Abraham had. They, it was all going to go to him, right? Mm-hmm. And so, and slaves can marry your daughter. You know, like these were all rules. the The year of jubilee of forgiveness. I mean, these were all rules yeah. that were put in, in that were put in by God in order for him to slowly eliminate, right? And I think even in that, I think there was a um, uh, the the term slavery then is not the same meaning no, of the not term at all. today. Not at all. And you know, these people were in their own will. Yes. Choosing to enter into a family because they had lost, uh, they didn't have the money, they didn't have the job, for they didn't have, for whatever, for whatever reason, they willingly just said, I will work for you, yeah. and as long as you take care of me right. or my family or my well-being. Right. So that was and there's more that of component. a... Yeah, Absolutely, yeah. there's that component of it. But I guess I say that be, to say, all that to say that there was a genuine spiritual understanding mm-hmm. that was going on inside, you know, Martin Luther King Jr., and as a result, he looked at his human condition, the culture that he yeah. was living in, and therefore, rhetoric gave art in the form of speech that moved the culture and changed, you know, changed history, changed all of us. And as I was saying, you know, the fact that he was martyred um, also elevated it added a, a sense of almost urgency and elevated the cause and almost, you know, spring. spring Bring shot it forward, yeah. just like any other of the biblical martyrs. You yeah. know, the, the the disciples themselves sa- saved John. Yeah. You know, there was right. a beautiful gift he had, which was this ability to tell truth in love, um, and that is very hard mm-hmm. to do. Well, he um, he had all three. Yeah, he had the ethos. He had the yep, yep. He had the logos. Yep. and he had the pathos. And what you're talking about right now is the pathos, the mm-hmm. the love. Mm-hmm. The emotional connection yeah. with the audience. Right. And um, in, and in that, he was real. You know what I mean? He was real to people. Um, and like you said, he didn't have to go into um, some sort of remote location for some extensive study on why this is happening you know, it was as simple as as long as you understand why man is the way that he is, all I have to do is just show, bring a mirror, 
bring a mirror before the people yeah. so that they can take a look at the mirror and understand this is who I am. And that's really what he did. He walked with a mirror. And when he went into speeches, he brought a mirror. Mm. And he was able to show people. Sometimes, you know, you go back to the speeches and they're eloquent. Oh, you know, they're they're, amazing. They're, that's the art yeah. of it is that yeah. they're so smooth yeah. and delivery, almost as if it's spiritually delivered. Yeah, seriously. And you... Uh, but you understand if you really break down, I could probably say what he's saying in like four words that are like, you know, that are, you know, that can say exactly what he's saying because it's, it's so, it's so human condition again. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? It's all like, yeah, that duh, that's right. This is this. You're right. A one plus one equals two. Right. You know, why, why wouldn't we notice why, that? Yeah. Why but would the it be any other that, way? <laughs> but the fact that it was so digestible. You yeah. know, so why was some. it digestible, right? Let, let's let's go there. It yeah. is uh, digestible. Why was it digestible? Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you all two two story openings, two two very famous story openings, and and we're gonna compare and contrast them, right? So, once upon a time, mm -hmm. blah 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 blah. We all know once upon a time. That's how you begin a child's sure. story. Yeah. I, you know, you talk to your son and you go, okay, well. Once upon a time, there was a little boy, yeah, and yeah, yeah, he blah, yeah. blah, 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 right? Um, likewise, the moment that you hear that in our culture in America today, we immediately know, oh, we're going into storytelling mode, the yeah. story is being told. Likewise, here is, I have a dream! Yeah. That, right there. Right. Appealing, I mean, like, I'm just, just hearing that alone, you know, yeah. like, right, off, right off the bat, you know... You, you're, you're being transformed. Right. You're being taken somewhere. Well, you're going on a journey. Right. And, and, and this is the art here. He didn't take it and slap them with it in the sense of it was his hope. It was his desire. It was his vision for the future. You yeah. know, it wasn't like you need a change because look at what you're doing. It was like this is what life should be. This is what this is what God intended. Yeah. For human, for the for mankind, and yet we have, you know, eaten each other alive. Yeah. It's like he's saying, "Here is a fairy tale." Sure. Yeah. That we can all realize is true. Yeah. That it, you know, like once upon a time, you know, the princess and then the prince and then they rode off into the sunset and lived happily ever after. I have a dream that, you know equality, this is it, and we all live happily ever after. But in his delivery, he's saying, but that can be attained, that can be now, that mm -hmm. can be all of us. Mm -hmm. And it was inclusive. Yeah. And it was dialogue in that as though he, the hearers were listening, even today, as we listen today, mm -hmm. we relate. And that's what we talked about. Remember last week, you talked about, well, what defines art? The moment that there's a conversation between the art piece or the artist and the, the audience, you know, where you're responding to what is being given. Um, art is now being made. Mm hmm um, that's what that kind of rhetoric does. Mm -hmm. It allows the individual to self-examine, um, to self-assess, to check their own hearts, yeah. their own motives, their own thoughts, um, and join them on that journey. Join them on that ride that they want to take us on. Mm -hmm. If it's rhetoric, it's join them in the speech. If it's art by, by, by a painter, then it's to follow the strokes you know, if it's a movie, it's to follow the cinematic action and the and the the frames and the angles and the cuts. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And he did that. Yeah. He framed and he angled and he cut with, using specific techniques. So one of the techniques, for example, that I want to bring up is um, the law of three, mm. right? Um, the rule of three. Sure. Okay. The rule of three. Um, you know, it's, it's a lesser known tactic unless you're really well versed in storytelling, which again attributes to, you know, Martin Luther King's artistry as an orator who was purposeful and he was persuasive. Um, so like, and people do this all the time. People use the, the rule of three even by accident. Like sometimes you see it on a Facebook post or an IG and you're like, oh wow, they're really convincing in their speech, you know, because of this technique that they are, they're using. And, and you see it even in cinema. 
Mm-hmm. You know, it's like it takes three times, for example, to establish something. So, like, for example, uh, even Chekhov's gun. You know, like, if you show a gun at the beginning of the movie, you need to not only see that gun established somewhere else, but you need to see the reason why that gun was shown. And so, like, if you show it in threes, then it's like, okay, it has been introduced, it has been established, and, you know, and, and it has been exited out. You mm-hmm. know, and so it's realized its full purpose, mm-hmm. right? And so, and, and as an orator, he did this a lot. You know, um, the, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm losing my, my, my train of thought, but you know, like as a, as a technique, he would employ this approach and, you know, and you, and you see this like even, even Abraham Lincoln, for example, uh, another amazing orator, um, mm-hmm. same exact similar techniques, yeah. but like, for example, you know, life, liberty, and uh, pursuit of happiness, a government of the people, by the people, yeah, yeah. for the people. Um, you know, it's just, mm-hmm. it's, it's, a, it's, it's structure and the, the, this type of thing that like ends up strengthening the, the argument because it emboldens the, the clause and what you're trying to say and it, just, it gives it definition. Yeah. Um, I don't, it's just, you know, techniques. It's just techniques yeah. of the storyteller. I mean, uh, I think sometimes persua- persuasion gets a bad rap. And I think it, um, you have to think about um, the intent of, the, of, the, of, of that artistic delivery. Um, so, for instance, like Abraham Lincoln, well, you have to think, well, um, you know, he was able to give that out and then be able to persuade the masses. Um, does that necessarily mean because the masses have been persuaded that it's right? I personally, I don't think so at all. However, it's the intent of the ethical purpose of the delivery. So, yeah. so you know, it's that, you know, the, you have to, and this is something that I know I personally do, and I'm sure you do, and even through scripture, <coughs> we're called to do, is to test every word, mm-hmm. you know, um, to make sure that it aligns and is in alignment with a a, a moral a, a moral structure a moral um uh how do i say it um uh, uh, balance of both of righteousness and truth yeah. you know and that's something that even today we're dealing with that is being blurred because the yeah. more we blur that the harder it is to be able to um, reel people back in persuasion to to truth in love you know at that point art will be whatever it wants to be you know what I mean um, it could be art can the truth can be found in my art or should I say my art can become truth and um, and I can you know share it and persuade in any yeah. in any you know yeah and and I'm glad you brought up persuasion and you know in the bad rap that that it gets and because it can it can it can lead to right to bad things right but right. it could also but I mean the rule of three is precisely as is for the sake of persuasion because right. once something has been established you know or it's been introduced it's established and then you know kind of like you know, solidified you can do so in threes that's why like so much of our uh children's stories so a lot of our children's stories and our fairy tales are all in threes you know mm-hmm. um you know the, the th- three little pigs um you know so you've got the wolf and the, and the three little pigs yeah. you've got you know goldilocks and the three bears um you know you, you, you've got um the three blind mice that my you know papa used to yeah. sing all three blind mice well you even think about uh, shooting you dice. know fool me once shame on you fool me twice Shame on me. They fooled me <laughs> third time. It was like, a, ain't no fooling ain't me, no third, fool time. me <laughs> third time. So, right. That was, that was, uh, uh, oh gosh, that, that was his best attempt as a, you know, as a presidential orator to use the, the rules of three. Poor, yeah, poor Bush right. trying right. to be an excellent orator and using the rules of three. But yeah, no, I mean, look, that's, that's, I, in part, I, I do believe that, that, that is, um, you know, the three act structure. That's the purpose uh, and a reason behind the three act structure because the the art that you create in film and in in cinema takes mm-hmm. those three acts in order to um, tell your story effectively and 
efficiently, you know, as efficiently as possible, effectively, however, and to com and convincingly to tell you that this this hero's journey needed to be as is because here are the three acts that I'm going to take you to persuade you that this journey needed to happen this way. And in you watching that, something subconscious is happening is that you're being persuaded of the truths and the themes and the ideas that are being preached by the story, mm -hmm. right? And, um, and that's not, you know, we've talked about act structure in one of our past episodes. We talked about three act structure, five act structure. We've even talked about seven act structure. And I encourage you to go back into the archives and check some of those. I can't remember the exact episode number, but it's in there. Go back and check it out because we do talk about the purposes and the uses of acts in your storytelling. And oh, four act structure even in, in, in TV, mm -hmm. you know, why they are and why it is the way that it is. But like the reason why it's not, not, much, not often found to be less than that Unless, you know, you're talking about theater where, you know, sometimes you can get into one act play or two actor. But um, in, in film is because of that precise um, desire is to establish a thing, to, you know, uh, strengthen it and to solidify it um, as you exit it out. And mm -hmm. you've got those three points. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there's... Um, uh, there, there, there are other examples. I mean, he, as, as you're trying to persuade, even as we continue talking about Martin Luther King, I mean, like, where did he get his inspiration from as far as how right. he spoke? Right, you know, absolutely. And, and it wasn't just the reason why he was speaking. What he was speaking about wasn't just the only thing that was influencing him. It was, what was influencing him is also the style mm -hmm. in which he was speaking wasn't something that was new to him. Right. right? Where did we see that? Right. And, and we Jesus, saw that. Right. Yeah. You, you know, you think about um, Jesus just as the person um, and how he spoke. Um, what he said was basically what the Jews have been reading for years. But when he said it, it was as if there was something uh, refreshing about his words. Um, a, believed to be a common man. You know, who is this common man that speaks with such eloquence and such knowledge of the things of God? Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, when he spoke, he spoke the revelation of the Old Testament. He explained these things in a parable. He gave people uh, an explanation of a story. He led them through this story to help them understand the simplicity of God's intention. Yeah. You know, when you go back and you read Numbers and Deuteronomy and you read all these Old Testament scriptures, you're like, this is, I'm falling asleep. But, but what he did is he, it's not so much that he simplified it, but he clarified it. He, uh, he, he, he gave it, he gave it, um, he, he brought it to life in a sense. And so um, that was, you know, a lot of what Martin Luther King was able to do. You know, he discerned, you know, this was Jesus's, uh, what he did. Yeah, that he was his brought, approach to storytelling. He brought to life truth. Yeah. He made it clear and it was palpable. And for some, yeah. for instance, like Jesus, for some who... Uh, who wanted to live regardless of truth, um, you know, wanted to live in that particular tradition and not be shaken and not be moved, yeah. you know. And so that is the same thing for Martin Luther King. There were people who didn't want to be shaken or moved, and yeah. that's what they wanted, and yeah. uh, regardless if it was true. And that's a very dangerous thing as well. And that's why I said it's important um, that, you know, that within that three-act structure, within that three-form um, um, of um, delivery, that you're constantly discerning uh, the delivery, constantly yeah, aware of the delivery. Absolutely. I mean, look, I, I, I see the, that three-act structure paralleled not only in Martin Luther King, and, uh, but, but also in Jesus. And, and, and there was certainly a, gr a great awareness to, you know, how this, what not only how it was being delivered, but what exactly was being said. I mean, like, I'm, I'm thinking about like the, the, the most famous parable. Everyone knows this parable, whether they're Christian or they're not. They know the parable of the prodigal son, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And even that parable is broken down into three-act structure. That parable begins with the life of the son, 
prior to leaving, you know, it's like it tells us about the, the house, yep. the scenario, two brothers, you know, it gives us the 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 the, the story background, the it gives yep. us an inciting incident, you know, the son became indignant and wanted out. You know, and, and decided to, you know, give me my inheritance. Then you've got the second act where he's out in the world yep. experiencing the riot, the crazy life and the crazy living. There are cl- obstacles that challenge him along the way. And then finally, when he's at rock bottom, we turn the act into the third and final act where he decides to come home. You know, after having gone out and experienced the world he comes back home and brings back a new knowledge and a new understanding. You know, he, he has a revelation. Even my, my father's servants um, eat better than I do. Mm-hmm. And he brings back a new, a boon, you know, if you will, a, uh, a new knowledge that will impact his old world. And he changes the old world where there is now a redemption of, uh, of life and of living in this home now that the son that was now, that was once dead has now been found. And there's a bit of a dun 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 to be continued. A little aftermath. Right? Yeah. There's a little aftermath, right? <clears throat> What's the aftermath? The the brother that was there that never once, you know, betrayed his father and worked diligently has a bit of like iniquity that's found in his heart, you know? And and so like those are the, I mean that's that is that is storytelling at its mm-hmm. finest, you know, mm-hmm. and that is precisely, again, using the rule of threes, yeah. that is precisely what great orators will do. Now yeah. that's for good. We've also seen it being used for evil. Yes. And that's yes. why that's why earlier when we talked about art is that um you know where is there a, where do you draw the line like this is this is a, this is a really tough subject because right. like censoring because masses art, were persuaded. Right. Masses were persuaded. Now here's an example of masses being persuaded by great ed- uh, rhetoric that you know rivals you know that basically reaches the level of art and that is Hitler. Yeah. Adolf Hitler. Yeah. Adolf Hitler um despite the fact that he was a you know psychopath um he was a great speaker mm-hmm. so much so that he was able to literally brainwash mm-hmm. and the minds of so many of his countrymen <clears throat> in order to them to fulfill the atrocities the destruction the evil that he did but he did it with what he did it with great rhetoric mm-hmm. rhetoric design design yeah uh, so much story Propaganda, um, yes, of course, but even that, <clears throat> as the propaganda was being put out, it was mm-hmm. all part of his story yeah. of the design of the of what he was, mm-hmm. you know, putting forth. Uh, I mean, and, and he and he used it to influence culture. He knew what he was doing. He yeah. says, "Look, I'm going to use art and this an art strategy, an art technique, whether as an orator or even I mean, because he was very heavily involved in 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 like show, films." propaganda films, showing films. Um, he was very heavily involved in art and censoring of art and the destruction and the removal of art from other places because he was trying to control culture. You know, as long as you can destroy the art of a people, you can also influence and destroy the mind, the heart, that which makes them human. Mm-hmm. If you destroy a person's art, you destroy their humanity because you're destroying that which makes them human, their expression. Mm-hmm. You're destroying, again, those, those, those things that we said earlier, their love, their fear, their joy, mm-hmm. their hope, those incalculables those things that cannot be measured you know that are expressed through art when you destroy the art you destroy those things and you're able to control the people that's why he you know he used what was it the it was like the the chamber of of of, uh i have notes somewhere um like the reich chamber of culture i I can't pronounce the german word but like the the reich or whatever Mm -hmm. it is you know he used he created this chamber of culture and it's called of culture in order to affect and influence the culture all around him mm-hmm. with the, the agenda to obviously to deliver his persuasion, his story, yeah. you know, that there are those that are above others, you know, that, they're, that the Aryan race is above, you know, all others. Um, and it had very destructive, very chaotic, um, very evil, pretty much plainly simple, mm-hmm. evil effect. And that's why, like, okay, um, sh- like, what do you do with that? Do you censor? Like, do you, is it then, are we supposed to censor that? Yeah. I, you know, that, that's a hard topic, and I don't yeah. know that it's one that we're prepared to go into right now. I think we would need, you know, um, 
professionals to kind of get involved and engage in, in such a, a conversation, you know, to talk about this sure. kind of stuff yeah. that deal with psychology and the human mind. Yeah. And they deal, you know, with censorship and, you know, and, and all that stuff. Yeah. But it's a it's a tricky thing to navigate, yeah. isn't it? You not? know, it, it very it, it is because, you know, it already brings alarms when it, certain art begins to dehumanize people. Um, yeah. And, and it, it, you begin to discern when something is off. Uh, or when something needs to be checked, yeah. um, when the human uh, is is doesn't become a human anymore, uh, yeah. you know, uh, where they become uh, nothing but an animal or yeah. or devalued, um, or even yeah. to the intent of the heart of one's individual to want to murder, kill, get rid of steal, another destroy, human being, steal, kill, destroy. You know, any of that. Everyone, you ask them, um, and they have a law written within them that know that these things are wrong, you know, and, you know, they, 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 because the moment that they, it, the moment that it's done to them, there's a reaction. You know what I mean? And so uh, that's where art becomes very dangerous. Yeah. Um, and if it, um, if it, if, if the act of the art incites, um, you know, violence, um, these are things that, you know, you have to be, you know, aware of uh, yeah. and, 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 and perhaps take action. Yeah. So, and we it, see it all it, around it's, us. It's you know, it's it's not just relegated to just what you know what, to Hitler. I mean, like we see it. Heck, we see it today in our media, in mm -hmm. our news outlets. You know, using storytelling techniques in order to control the masses to a specific violence. yeah, and to, to ignite violence, to have you know certain partisan uh, you know outcomes, and um, I, we see it. Mm -hmm. We see it, and that's mm -hmm. you know. That is the, the both the the beauty and the beast of art, mm -hmm. you know. Um, that it is so connected to humanity and the human condition that it can be used for manipulative purposes or for a blessing, you know, mm -hmm. um, to give something beautiful to someone or to give something that you know that is depraved or that is for only self and pure benefit you know that is selfish mm -hmm. or to or to or self-serving self-seeking you know i always thought um when i used to read scripture and then i would always ask myself um you know god why why did you have the people always destroy all these idols and all these things uh their art really um but if i go way back to the beginning and i read the first part of that that chapter it says do not go in do not partake. Yeah. So it was more so, not so much that he wanted to destroy them, but he didn't want them to influence them. So it, the intent wasn't destruction. The destruction was the outcome of what was necessary for their danger. Yeah. You know, get, get rid of these things that they're going to destroy you as a human being. Yep. Um, but it never needed to get there. Um, because the whole purpose of it was to separate, to be set apart, to not allow these things to influence you. And I think that's where it mattered to God the most, the separation. Yeah, yeah. You know? And so, yeah, because, well, it was connected to their relationship with him, with one him. whom is all righteous and all holy, and therefore yeah. there are certain things that would sever that, right. that connection right. of righteousness and holiness. Yeah. Right. Right, yeah. because at the end of the day, if you look at the scriptures, it talks about, you know, uh, allowing them to live their depraved minds or whatever it was. Yeah, allowing them, them up, giving, giving, giving them, them up, them to up their own you know, let them, you know, that w whatever they have done will be accounted to them. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so it wasn't so much that he was going, all right, let's go down the street. Let's destroy this one just because, you know, he was always just, just stay with me. Stay yeah. close to me. Yeah. Well, and that is, that is the power, the authority the ability of art and what it can do. Um, I'll leave you all with, uh, with a really cool quote. Um, I'm, some of you will pick it up immediately and know exactly where it is that, that it's from, but uh, I'll just read the quote and I'll tell you where it's from. We don't read and write poetry because it's cute. We read and write poetry because we are members of the human race. And the human race is filled with passion. And medicine, law, business, engineering, these are noble pursuits and necessary to sustain life. But poetry, 
beauty, romance, love. These are what we stay alive for. That's Robin Williams mm. and uh, the Dead Poets Society. Now, in that quote, um, you can you know you can substitute the word poetry for any art form. You know whether sure. it's painting, music, mm-hmm. painting. Music, you know, yeah. um, and it rings true. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a good way to close this segment on art. Um, and so I guess uh, you know a, a, a final word. You as artists. Um, I think we said this in the past in the past episode. With great art comes great responsibility, mm-hmm. right? With great art comes res- great responsibility. So as you are web slinging, flying, crawling, shooting, whatever it is that you're doing in your cinema and your filmmaking, know that as an artist you carry the burden of a great responsibility. Where what you are doing is not detached from those around whom are whom are either partaking or themselves a part of it. It is all connected, we're all interconnected, and thus uh, art becomes a kind of a major responsibility as artists that we bear to, to carry and to do Yeah, right. you know, as I'm thinking, even on the last episode till now, it really now, I think it's a, uh, not that we're, you know, of uh, some sort of, you know, heavily you know some scholars no. but but i think that we brought up <laughs> <Quite> good <opposite. laughs> brought up good topics um and it makes you now think about that major debate about yeah. statues about all yeah, these yeah, different yeah, things yeah. you know yeah, now yeah, what do you think about statues right now, now yeah, what do absolutely. you think about this or what do you think about that um in the context of art right and dialogue and dialogue and yeah. getting and having them and looking at that and having conversations yeah and, and, and getting to know each other and understand each mm-hmm. other and one another and why that speaks to me, why that speaks to you. Yeah. The same exact way, going back to standing there in front of the statue of David, mm-hmm. some were laughing, I was crying, mm-hmm. and I could turn to them and say, why does this make you move the way that it does? And mm-hmm. I then could turn to the German, the, the, the French, mm-hmm. the, the Spanish person to my right and to my left and know them as mm-hmm. an individual and as a person yeah. because of dialogue. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. All right. Well, there we have it. It's time for our creator's tip of the week. All right. Yeah. Um, you got so, something? Yeah, I think I got you some. Do. I think, well, I, I actually needed it, so I downloaded it. It was referred to me by my cousin, Luis. Luis. A little shout um, out to Luis. Who's yeah. A working brilliant hard. Emmy Award winning uh, designer, um, filmmaker, filmmaker. And, um, I, he, I was asking him, I was like, listen, you know, if I get a computer and I, and I need something that I'll be able to have a webcam for, you know, my computer doesn't have it. And he's like, download this app because obviously why can't your phone be turned into a webcam? Uh-huh. You know? And so you use these applications on your computer, or on your laptop, but you plug in this app and it can connect those to those applications from this app and the app is called here we are iv cam yeah. iv cam it needs wi-fi it needs a usb uh to connect to the computer but apps can connect through that app so like a zoom or like a facetime or any of these other ones can connect to that app to use your phone as a webcam yeah. Pretty cool. Yeah. The reason I share that, I think that's a good tip because if you're ever doing a podcast, if you're ever traveling, if you ever want to do some sort of, uh, for instance, you know, we're doing a documentary, so we're in need of doing, getting um, uh, Zoom conferences and recording those and screen capturing those things and stuff like that. And doing it with a better camera than like the one that's native and built into your laptop. You can do it with the iPhone 11, which has a amazing, yeah, that's cool. What's it called? IV Cam. IV Cam. IV Cam. Pretty cool. Is yep. it free? It is free. Oh, it is free. What? I have not How seen. How these people make money off these amazing ideas? Because my tip of the week is oh, not yeah. and, free. And it can and it can use the 4K camera on here. Cool. Which is good. It's good to know. Yeah. Mine is not free. My uh, tip of the week is twenty nine dollars a month. Okay. Well. It is a membership. There's a okay. monthly fee. Okay. Um, but, uh, you know, you can, there's no contractual agreement or anything like that. It's kind of like CC, you know, where you could just stop it at any time. Yeah. However, it's called Switcher Studio. And the reason why it came to me is because what we've been having 
a slight bit of a uh, issue when it comes to our Zoom meetings and you know and actually our um, you know when we meet together uh, as a as a church family um, you know we've been trying to set up a way to create kind of like a a mobile broadcasting system, yeah, a multi-cam yeah. setup. Yeah. This is uh, necessary, by the way, right now with yeah, everything. Yeah, well, so. and it could be for anything. Whether you're yeah. like, again, you're doing a video podcast, a video cast, or um, you know, or you're, you know, you're doing like a a simple little live event or little round table reading and you want to record it and you want to have multi cameras I mean you can take your friends phones or, or iPads and use switcher studio um, it creates professional quality live video content using just iPhones and iPads um, and you can edit while you shoot you can edit as you're going you can switch between your cameras or your phones um, you could do photo video so you don't have to waste you know time later I mean it's kind of like as you go um, and you can stream live through it. Oh wow. You can stream live and you can use it in stream live to YouTube or to Facebook and you can capture 1080p or 4K. Oh awesome. That's good. Quality. Um, and you can output to uh, like or you can output to a projector or to an external display. I mean it allows you to do it all. Obviously, you know, if you're doing it through your iPhone, you're going to need like the the third party um, connectors and dongles and whatnot sure, to connect yeah, yeah, it. Yeah. But yeah, it, it's it's an ability for you to be able to basically have uh, a production studio uh, just with your phone. So ours is similar. Yeah, and if you don't have a camera, use IV use, Cam and you're good. There it is. Switch it through the... Imagine you can use a whole bunch of phones. Yeah, no, that's what I'm saying. Everybody, give people. me all your phones. We're going to line them all up. And next thing you know, you're doing bullet time matrix stuff. There you go. You know, as you're preaching the word, Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, yeah. that is it. And, uh, we'll end there. I'm glad we're ending there because who knows where it could go from here. Yeah. yeah. I think we're, we're ready we're to uh, get back to work, back to work on all the stuff that we've got going on. We've got some pretty fun and exciting things going on right now at Mount Harvest, things that we're going to be sharing with you all very soon, yep. um, new productions, new works, uh, some things that are in pre-production, uh, some things that are moving really rapidly in pre-production, big projects that we're really really excited about narrative work um all coming soon as uh you know we'll, we'll be hinting and dropping some clues and some some nuggets during some of our podcasts sure. you know and if you listen to all of them back to back to back you'll be able to to discern what it is that we're talking about so now you got to go in and you got to watch all of them all yes. 23 and piece it together piece like it together because you're going to know precisely what it is that we're talking mm -hmm. about because there's a nugget in every one yep we're like the russo brothers we're dropping easter eggs little ones here and there everywhere Right? Nebula. She's going to come back and be... I, have never, I don't know where I'm going with this. Just leave it there. Let's just leave it there. All Another right. One. Well, everyone, thank you for joining The Harvest. Um, for any small questions that you may have, you can reach me on Twitter at xgarcia. And I'm at Jonathan Harvest. Any longer questions, you can reach us at info at mountharvest.com. Feel free to write and get a hold of us there and, you know, just kind of ask any questions. I mean, we'll luck, li excitedly hurriedly immediately bring them on to air and talk about them because we love the interaction a lot of the stuff that we have received has been like personal questions and stuff like about things that people are like oh you don't have to talk about this and so we've respected that as well so if you have something that you don't want discussed ask us let us know we can give you the answers right away special thanks to our producer chelsea cowie who's in studio today she's currently editing on da vinci resolve right now slaving away um but uh thank you all and if you have any you know um, desire to support what it is that we do, you can surely check us out on Patreon. We have a page. If you love it, cool. Uh, be a patron. You can donate at uh, patreon.com forward slash the harvest podcast or not. Either way, we're going to continue doing this because we love it, because we love you. We love dispensing this information, connecting with you all. It's a passion for us. Uh, yeah, that's yeah, it. And please don't forget to embrace that subscribe button. Share a like as well. That's beautiful. Yes. Very gentle. Just Embrace it. I Goodbye, love how guys. he takes the actions for it. <laughs> I gotta act it out. Join us at the patreon.com forward slash the harvest podcast for some BTS footage of our cinema production life.